and he's the first one the wolf is going to catch. There's a two-headed turtle. That's mutant. It's not ninja, but it's mutant, okay? Now, he's going to freeze first winter. Nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. Hmm? They don't. Okay. Uh, scrambling up letters from the word Christmas will get you all sorts of different words, but you will never get Xerox out of Christmas. The letters aren't available. And scrambling up an existing gene code, which is what a mutation does, does not give you some new, improved information. It doesn't do it. This textbook shows the kids a four-wing fly. And it says normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four, and by the way, it cannot fly. It says this rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Now watch this. Beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Well, excuse me, why didn't they show us a beneficial mutation? Why did they show us a bad one and tell us about the good ones? Show me a good one. There's never been one. One professor said, oh, there's a good mutation. People in Africa that get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. I said, well, that's brilliant, sir. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot, you know? <laughs> that's just brilliant. They tell the kids evolution and natural selection go together. This one says evolution, natural selection causes evolution. Oh, come on. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. Here's the world's smallest horse. Pretty tiny, useless, doesn't bark. I mean, what, what good is it, you know? Um, natural selection does not create. How people got this crazy idea that natural selection is a creative force, I don't know, but it's not. It doesn't create a thing, it just simply selects. It's a quality control. And if we had time, we'd get into a lot more of that. Quality control does not change the car to an airplane if you select all the bad cars, okay? Everything in nature was designed and uh, if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but there is a designer, and we're going to all stand before him one of these days, maybe pretty soon. Thank you so much. Before I turn to genetics, I want to make a few comments on what we've just heard here and the level of honesty of the person making these comments. Because this is someone who feels free to call other people liars and to use the word lie uh, about uh, a whole set of people and a whole set of activities. Uh, yet he uh, uh, has some vulnerability on exactly that subject. Let's just deal with trivia first of all. Symbiosis requires simultaneous creation. That's nonsense. We have many numerous studies of symbioses beginning and in some cases symbioses breaking down and you don't have to imagine simultaneously everything's in place in order to get it to evolve. That's an elementary error that's been around in some forms for over a hundred years. He claims that evolutionary theory is not science but is religion because science, he says, is derived from observation and study. And since you can't actually observe a fossil change into a different fossil, then therefore your discussions on what you assume happened is religious. That's nonsense again. There are all kinds of observations you make. Um, and studies you make that lead to inferences and conclusions from which you can derive uh, a given result. So that's fatuous that we're talking about opposing religious schools. Um, now, regarding his uh, infatuation with the term liar, I urge on you two uh, websites that you can go to if you want a deeper knowledge of this. One is www.talkorigins.org, and that'll deal with very detailed refutations of the bizarre story he's peddling about how uh, this universe came about. There is one that may appeal to some of you in this audience even more. It's called AnswersInGenesis.org. It is an explicitly Christian uh, website. But it has a subsection called Arguments Creationists Should Not Use, and this is devoted to arguments that this character has used in the past, and that are recognized as being uh, dishonest in content 
and almost certainly uh, dishonest in intent, including various kinds of lies he's told about Darwin's deathbed conversion, about uh, Thomas Henry Huxley talking about free sex, a basking shark found off of Japan really being a plesiosaur and so forth and so on. I don't have the time to deal with this kind of trivia, but I urge you, if you've got an interest in a slightly more mature Christian uh, creationist approach, to check answers in Genesis, or if you're interested in the evidence more broadly, to check talkorigins.org. Um, All evidence has been proven fraudulent. Everything has been disproven. Nonsense. This is spontaneous generation, he claims. Again, nonsense. Spontaneous generation was a notion that you could get a frog appearing out of nowhere. Uh, mutations never make things better. Now, that's a lie. We have many examples of mutations that are beneficial, including, for that matter, the mutation that in heterozygous form, that's where you have one of them and you don't have the other, provides you with protection from malaria. A mutation that is disproportionately uh, present in African American people derived from an area that was high in malaria. And then he repeats an old, old canard, natural selection does not create, it only destroys, it only selects. Natural selection is a continual selective process, but it moves the frequency distribution of genes beyond the distribution that existed when it started, and it can create brand new creations relatively quickly that have never existed before. It's elementary. Now let me go back to talking about genetics for a second, because this is a second kind of uh, another kind of problem you get into when you just invent something out of whole cloth and imagine that it's going to fly. If you've got an ark full of two of each kind and only maybe ten human beings, we know for sure they're going to have to practice inbreeding for a number of generations. Because you only got two individuals, let's hope it's male and female, the offspring have got to breed among themselves, the grandchildren have got to breed among themselves, the great-grand offspring have got to breed among themselves, because there ain't any other individuals around. We know, and it's an elementary calculation, that it takes about seven generations to wipe out all genetic variability. Now, this level of inbreeding imposed on all organi or organisms has destroyed, it's destructive, in the way he moans and groans about uh, natural selection. It destroys uh, genetic variability and it destroys knowledge. Now, um, 6,000 years ago this all happened according to him. That's about 200 generations since then. We have plenty of good observations through study that in humans you accrue roughly a new mutation per generation. So each of you in here can be happy that you're a mutant to some uh, fair probability. Now, if you allow 200 generations, then we can allow the accumulation of 200 new uh, mutations uh, during that period of time. That would lead to 40,000 of your genes. Only 200 of them would show variability due to a new mutation. In fact, out of our 40,000 genes, 4,000 of them show genetic variability. How can you generate this consistent with his hypothesis? Well, again, you'd have to invent some ad hoc hypothesis. You'd have to say, well, for reasons unknown to us and without any evidence for it whatsoever and inconsistent with everything we know about current life, there was a rain of mutations that struck not just humans but struck all other creatures as well. And then you think, oh, well, I've gotten myself out of that. Yes, I've got to imagine another absurdity, but fine, I'm out of the immediate bind. But it ain't that easy. Because if 